Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Open Security Summit session. Uh, today is the 14th of uh, April, T21, Wednesday. And we are uh, joined by Jeff tonight uh, to talk to us about data brokerage. What does it look like? He has made some research. It started as a hobby, then it started it turned into a research, and he's going to share with us uh, what he found. A little bit about Open Security Summit. This is a very collaborative environment. We all come together on the topics that we find interesting and we share our ideas and uh, findings together. So thank you and over to you, Jeff. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, again, this is uh, about the uh, modern data broker landscape. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm uh, Jeff Jokish with Privacy Plan also known as Privacy Stan on uh, Twitter. Uh, I'd like to thank the Open Security Summit for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, Carrie Lenning first introduced me to this organization, so a special shout out to her. Another quick thanks to uh, Didar for uh, moderating this event for me. This is actually- the, Our the, pleasure, really, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely, and thanks. Um, uh, well, this is actually the first time I've given this presentation in public, so I'm not sure actually how long it's going to take to cover the prepared material. So I am hoping that you'll, you know, join in and, and make this as interactive as possible, uh, especially, you know, at the at the slide breaks. Um, feel free to jump in and ask questions if anything is unclear or, you know, if you just want to some, explore something a little bit further. So help me make this interactive. Um, ask, you know, questions out loud if you want to unmute yourself or via chat if you don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, you know, and make the questions challenging or just fun. So let's 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 do this, right? Um, with that out of the way, let's get on to the show. Back in 2011, I moderated a forum called Identity and Reputation in a Digital World on Google Plus. Uh, I had a keen interest in that subject matter. At the time, people were sort of figuring out how to express themselves online. Instagram was ascendant, selfies were becoming popular, and this was sort of impacting our concept of identity uh, as a nation and as a world. There was a lot of discussion about the value and the problems caused by anonymous and pseudonymous posts on social media. Privacy on the internet gave us freedoms of expression that were simply amazing. It's not just for criming, it's also for kids in wheelchairs who are made whole again by the virtual world and girls who can break through every barrier. People can be whoever they wanna be on the internet. It can be a great equalizer. I wanted to know how to manage users of a text-based search engine called ChaCha many of whom were teenagers. At the time, we had to ban many of those teenagers for bad behaviors. So it had me thinking a lot about profiling and identity and how we log into services, how we're tracked online. And when I ran across this article from Cashmere Hill about data brokers selling lists of rape victims and alcoholics and sufferers of erectile dysfunction, it was chilling. How could this be legal? The lists promised a thousand names for the low, low price of 79 bucks, less than eight cents to figure out that a person's life sucked. Wow. You know, this was really my, you know, one of my introductions to the problems that we have with data brokers. And so began my exploration. But were those leads on alcoholics and rape victims really that much of a stretch from other common practices that we see? A few years prior, I was buying data, data you might be uncomfortable with. I was director of marketing for a mortgage company, doing refinances mostly. Yeah, one of those companies. They were an ethical player, um, but they were in a space where rules were easy to bend and often bent. At this company, we bought data from credit bureaus and other sources. Here's the thing. The best performing data was info that you had a mortgage inquiry on your credit report. When you try to get a mortgage, that shows up on your credit report. Credit bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion, Experian, they will all sell 
those credit headers based on qualifiers like you just had a mortgage inquiry. And this is why you get spammed with offers. Every time you are offered credit, the credit bureaus make money selling you. And your interest in a mortgage isn't the only thing that creates money for brokers. They love to capture life trigger events, as well as tagging you with attributes. The accuracy of those projections can be uncanny, and they can also be completely wrong. So the data accuracy can suck. I can see a few statistics here on the screen. They only get your sex right about 42% of the time, which seems pretty funny given that they could probably just flip a coin and get it right 50% of the time, right? <laughs> the, the age tier is only correct 70%, 77% of the time. Tags are only correct 80% of the time. And that's for things that are very broad like cooking or sports. Uh, this was uh, some information from uh, Harvard Business Review. But there's some additional statistics too. Uh, Caitlin Renee Miller of The Atlantic found back in 2017 that 50% of the personal data she got from a broker about herself was inaccurate. Uh, Deloitte uh, did a 2017 survey of vehicle data and home data. For the vehicle data, they found that 44% 44, 44 of that data was completely wrong, just absolutely incorrect. And for the home day, that wasn't much better. 41% had accuracy that was below 50%. Right? Researchers in 2019 found that data broker data uh, on ad targeting right, um, was not very good. And our field tests, they said, we found that ad targeting shown to the right demographic only 59% of the time. So there's some problems here, right? It really comes down to this when you look at things. If you're not the customer, you're the product. You probably heard that phrase a lot. The first use of this quote appears to be from a guy named Blue Beetle on the Metafilter community back in August of 2010. And he actually said this, when something is online is free, you're not the customer, you're the product. Now, not everyone is familiar with the evolution of advertising on the web, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but you should know that uh, it was the original intent of Google founders Page and Brin to never use advertising on Google. In their original academic paper about Google, they devoted an appendix to the evils of conventional advertising. Their academic paper argued that their method using PageRank was far more accurate than the existing search engines that relied on advertising specifically because it did not bias the results in order to make a profit. Their approach required the search engines to be transparent in the academic realm because the founders explained, advertising funded search engines will be inherently biased toward the advertisers and away from the needs of the consumers. Interesting where we've come, right? As a corollary to this though, even if you are the customer, you're probably not the only customer. An interesting uh, study that just came out called The Price Is Not Right, comparing privacy and free and paid apps had some pretty startling findings. 45% of paid versions of apps reused all or the same third-party libraries as their, as their, their free versions. And 74% of those paid versions had all of the dangerous permissions held by the free app. So even if you're paying for those apps right after you download them, you're probably still being tracked. I think it's important for us to understand that the businesses we in interact with, uh, the, they're becoming more and more complex. Uh, Apple is doing some pretty powerful things with their new privacy labels on apps, right? And privacy policies that are being more and more required by laws in different places can tell us more about who the data is being shared with, if, if only we read those 40 page documents, right? But I wonder if we shouldn't also be informed of every way that a company is monetizing our data, that might be actually the kind of transparency that we need. If it's our data, and I, I think this is the next logical step to transparency, if it is in fact uh, right in line with the principles of purpose limitation, I think we ought to know who's monetizing our data and how they're monetizing it. That's the kind of transparency I think that we actually need. So, right, we live in a market economy. Data is valuable. Some call data the next oil. 
Of course, data brokers are flourishing in this environment, but are they flourishing while our privacy is being compromised? Is our data that's being bought and sold? It's our data that is being bought and sold and copied endlessly like it was property. So make no mistake, data brokers believe that data is their property right and not your human right. That's, I think, sort of a fundamental problem that we have here. And I'd like to stop there and ask if we've got any questions about what I've sort of given you so far. I have one. And in the meantime, please, uh, others can also jump in. But so I think the intention of all the new laws is to make you the owner, the subject, the owner of the data. But data brokers, as you mentioned, we don't even know they're there. We don't even know who they are. So how are we going to get transparency on that? Well, I think that's a good question, right? I mean, I think there are a few laws that we're going to talk about in a minute that, that are going to force them to register, hopefully, right, and expose themselves. But um, I think that really what it's going to have to come down to is, you know, if we start actually owning our data and, and if they can't actually copy that data, uh, we'll talk about that too, then maybe some of that data starts to dry up. Um, but short of that, I don't know how, I don't know how we regulate them uh, because it's, it, it's pretty hard. We're, we're going to address that, but I think you've actually nailed the, the, the real crux of the issue there with that question. It, it's a very tough question. Hmm. Yeah. Because right now, I mean, you've got you've got all the, you've got laws like CCPA that says, okay, you've got the right to to demand uh, that that these companies um, you know don't sell your data. But how how are you going to do that? Are you going to go find out who they are, and are you going to then send um, you know two thousand different requests that uh, that they that they tell you that they've got your data and then request that they've removed it or that request that they that, that they don't sell it? Hmm. Uh, because they, they're probably just going to tell me, oh, we're not the data controller. You have to ask it from the controller. Right. Um, yeah. Craig, who, who's here with us, uh, Craig Erickson on, on the stream, has been doing research on that. And he can probably tell you that it's not going very well. Mm -hmm. And also, I think Tom and Dennis, they both unmuted themselves. So you guys uh, have questions? Tom? Yeah, this is very interesting um, material, Jeff. And given our experience with the laws that have been enacted already, like the CCPA, CPRA, GDPR, given our existing experience, do you have any degree of confidence that this cat can be put back in the bag and regulated? Uh, isn't it true that you know corporations might simply choose to pay the penalties as they come along because the data and the processing that they're doing is more valuable uh, and the fine is, is not of consequence. Uh, I, have my, I have my reservations about regulation of this. I'm not questioning your facts that this is chilling and, and is you know, overwhelming uh, in the amount of data that's being collected, but uh, to, to regulate it, I think is gonna be very difficult. That was my only comment. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I don't think that the current laws actually get at what the data brokers do. Um, we're gonna we're gonna cover a little bit of that in a minute, um, but it, you know, they they don't really they don't really put anything in place that's going to stop that from happening. You know, short of a data breach, uh, and the data breaches really don't even have that much of an impact, right? Um, the the fines for data breaches. Um, Aren't, aren't really all that bad. Uh, and they're not all that enforceable in most, most places. Europe a little bit more than the United States, but you've seen three big breaches happen in, in the last week or so, right? And they're not even enforceable in the United States. Yeah, I think a good first step is shining the light as you and others are doing, you in particular with your identification of the data brokers and creating a database. Uh, in essence, we're, we're spying on the spies. <laughs> we're, we're shining a light on that practice. And, at the very least, uh, that's a great start. Yeah. All right, are we moving on? Okay. So let's take a look, a quick look at the history of uh, data brokering. As far as I can tell, the, the business aggregation of consumer data in the United States started with uh, the Ruben H. Donnelly company 
they assert that they published the first classified directory of yellow pages for uh, in Chicago, Illinois in uh, 1886. Of course, the US Census started earlier back in 1790, gathering public data, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics started about the same time in 1884. Um, mainframe computers also came into the scene in 1960s, and as soon as that happened, people started using data to influence elections. Uh, there's actually an, a really insightful book out recently by historian Jill Laporte uh, called If Then that uh, details the story of the uh, Similmatics Corporation and their quest to use computers to predict human behavior um, from the all the way from the, the JFK election to the outcome of the, the Vietnam War. And there is some pretty interesting anecdotes in there about how they may have actually helped JFK win that election by figuring out how black voters uh, could influence that election. Um, it's, it's disputed as to whether that actually happened or not, but it's, it's really interesting read. You might, you might be interested in that. But it, it's very obvious that, that large scale data began as, as early as the 1960 and actually influencing public policy. Um, which I didn't realize that it had actually happened quite that far back, right? I, I talk about this because much of the role of data brokers has been in, in scooping up public policy, uh, sorry, public data uh, generated by the government, right? Data brokers make millions, billions even, converting government data into more useful forms from digitizing courthouse records to monopolizing the distribution of publicly, publicly funded scientific papers, right? Uh, in the early century, consumer credit uh, is where most of the data broker action was focused. As you can see here from the slide with Equifax and Diners Club and FICO scores and things like that, right? But once we get past that um, to, the, you know, to the 1970s, right, things started to change. And that's actually where we saw sort of the first regulation of data brokers and probably the only real significant regulation of data brokers happen with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, and that actually happened because of inadequate safeguards existing to protect consumers from the credit reporting agencies. Um, in the 1960s, significant controversy uh, surrounded the credit reporting agencies. Uh, reports were sometimes used to deny services and opportunities. And it was pretty crazy back then. I, a lot of people don't realize why that, that bill was passed, but individuals before that had no right to see what was in their credit file. Uh, there was abuse in the industry, including requirements that investigators fill quotas on negative information on data subjects. And there was fabrication of negative information, including lifestyle data uh, information on data subjects like sexual orientation and marital status and drinking habits and cleanliness, right? That was actually in credit files, right? <laughs> Crazy. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, like 40% 40, 40 of the data is not even accurate. Right, right. You know, and they were making stuff up because they, they had quotas that they had to fill. Right. So this was even worse back then. Right. Mm -hmm. So they had to do something and Congress acted uh, to regulate that very screwed up um, area. Right. Um, but that really only regulates the credit reporting agencies. And that's only a, a real small slice of the data broker uh, environment now, as, as we'll see, right? And as we move into the 1970s, right, uh, data brokering came onto its own and companies began to, to aggregate, but it was very manual and the ability to distribute was limited, right? Fee-based journals and eventually CD-ROMs helped that. You can see in the 1990s, uh, Lotus Marketplace, uh, uh, this household thing sort of came out. It actually never was actually released, but they had this whole CD-ROM that they were trying to put out with, with I think it was Equifax of 120 million Americans. Um, and uh, when it sort of hit the, the, uh, uh, mm. the news that they were gonna release this, they got so much bad press, they had to pull it. So it's like yellow pages, but for, um, yeah, for in electronic format that they were. Right. Right. Okay. But this was one of the first ones that they tried to release and it got a lot of press coverage and, and, and it was all very negative. So it, this one actually didn't happen. But, you know, a few years after that, all that data was just out there in, in a variety of other forms, right? Uh, because it was so easy to do and so, so profitable, right? Um, 
I actually bought some of those CDs of, of business listings and things like that. It wasn't actually personal listings, but I bought a lot of business listings, right? So um, at this point, brokers began primarily scooping up limited sets of public data. But as we know, around 1996, right, the internet came and that changed everything, right? And it also caused a whole lot of problems, right? Um, I think we know what the internet did to opportunities for brokers, and we'll see more of that soon, but, but let's look at a few of the problems, right? Uh, in 2003, Axiom's breach happened, and this was sort of interesting. Uh, Levine um, and snipermail.com were accused of stealing 1.6 billion uh, records from Axiom, uh, customer records uh, containing details, names, addresses, emails, uh, millions of Americans, billions, right, actually, a um, uh, total of 137 hacks between January and July of 2003. They resold the data, not only sold it, but resold it to spamming campaigns. Uh, and the primary problem there was access controls. Um, apparently, they gave him access to small amount of data, but he was able to get access to everything. Um, Choice Point had a problem. Um, and gave access to you know identity thieves essentially um <laughs> they actually had security uh, uh that should have stopped this but they turned it off and forgot to turn it back on which <laughs> tells you a little bit about you know how how little we've changed you know over the years and uh, lexus nexus uh in 2013 had a really terrible breach where they not only lost sensitive data but actually the security questions like you know your mother's maiden name in your school and you know all of those kinds of security questions that we still use today um and that was uh you know a really bad one that people probably don't remember today you know seven years ago or eight years ago but all these problems got the attention of the government um so there were actually senate hearings and and the ftc got involved and that that led us to uh uh, not really any action, but at least some Senate hearings and a report. And this was actually pretty pretty seminal. So the, the FTC did a really big report called uh, Data Brokers, a Call for Transparency and Accountability. And uh, they actually said uh, that they recommended that Congress consider legislation requiring data brokers to provide consumer access to data, including sensitive data about the, that was being held on them, a reasonable level of detail, the ability to opt out, um, that um, uh, it provides consumers, consumers with transparency when a company uses risk mitigation project, uh, products that limit consumers' ability to complete a transaction, and um, ad additional things for, for uh, organizations that are using people search products. So they really essentially said, this is bad and Congress needs to act. And that was seven years ago and we're still waiting, right? Nothing happened. <clears throat> no. So where does, that, where does that take us? Where are we now seven years later? How many data brokers are there? How big is this unregulated industry grown um, as we generate more and more data each year? The number of brokers out there, uh, the number that gets thrown around is like 4,000 data brokers, right? But that number, I traced that number back. That was a number that Pam Dixon threw out um, in 2013 when she was um, testifying in front of Congress, you know, uh, as part of all of this Hubble, Hubble blue. And my guess is that number is probably closer to 10,000 or 15,000 worldwide now. Uh, and we'll see why that's probably true as we delve a little deeper. If we look at the revenue, the number that I see most commonly thrown around is about 200 billion. I think it's closer to a trillion. Um, that's also an estimate, but because they're not really counting all the data brokers, they can't be counting all the revenue. And that's why I think the number is much higher. Um, let's take a look at one vision of what the data broker landscape looks like. Not my landscape, but somebody else's to sort of get an idea of why I think this is true. So in 2017, Cracked Labs uh, took a look at defining the landscape and, and this is what they came up with. It's a really complicated landscape. 
a really comprehensive effort and it helped guide me on my search for data brokers. I wish I had actually found this earlier. I only found it a couple months ago. Um, so if you take a look, it's got a, a whole bunch of different sections. Um, in the middle is sort of the, the ad tech advertising and marketing environment. Um, it's got customer management, advertising, business IT, risk data, marketing data, sort of a lot of things that we've talked about. But around it, it's got like the sort of larger ecosystem that we haven't talked about, right? Um, large platforms, Google and Facebook, Amazon, you know, telecom devices, service providers, you know, Samsung, ISPs, telcos and media like Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, media and publishing companies, right? Uh, retail, uh, consumer goods, um, public sector, you know, law enforcement, utilities, right? Those kinds of things. And, and if you think about really, right, um, it is really data brokers are, are, are in every aspect of, of our, our lives now, right? Um, I think it's an interesting point, point here that, that the crack labs is, is pretty much suggesting suggesting that every part of our society is now part of the data broker landscape. If you think about it, every each transaction, each product or service, each segment of our lives generates data. Everything we do generates data. I've referred to this as our, our sort of data exhaust as we go through our lives, flipping switches, liking things, buying things, driving somewhere, walking somewhere, opening an app, sending an email, speaking in front of our personal assistants or smart TVs. Virtually everything we do generates data. This is not inherently a bad thing, but the real problem is twofold. First, that we're not in control of this data. And second, that it not only gets sold, it gets copied over and over and over again, right? And that I think is the crux of the problem. Let's take a look at how one specific transaction works. Um, this is actually a, an example that the Washington Post published uh, uh, back in 2019. So um, if you take a look at here, there's a bunch of different uh, organizations. Um, in this particular case, uh, Advisors operates a collection of websites for college-bound students, including uh, privatestudentloans.com. And students who visit those sites are asked to enter their personal information on surveys for a chance to win scholarships of up to 10,000 uh, bucks. The company privacy policy says it may sell the data to a third party whose products and services we think may be of interest to you. ALC, a data reseller, takes the data from advisors and repackages it for marketers, according to an advertisement on their website. Uh, ALC, a data reseller, uh, sorry, ALC advertised, advertises a college-bound student master file, which includes the names and addresses of up to 3 million students at a rate of 95 bucks per thousand names. For a few extra dollars, marketers can also buy the names of the colleges each student plans to attend uh, and his or her expected fields of study. ALC told uh, marketers it used the data uh, from two additional companies to overlay uh, the student data with more details about them from Experian and Ethnic Technologies. So you can see how complicated this particular flow is, right? And it, this is just a, a relatively simple example, right? But the problem here is not so much a one single example. It's that the, your personal data is being copied at each and every step, right? Um, one company doesn't have your data. Five companies have your data. And now if you multiply this transaction and process across our entire economy, and maybe you begin to see the size of the problem, our data is everywhere. How, how can it possibly be safe? How can we possibly control it? I think this finally gets to the crux of the data broker problem. Now, let me stop here and you know, see if anybody has any interjections or questions. Yeah, I've got a question. It's about uh, data brokers that you know could be classified as a data broker, but they could also be a credit reporting agency, but they could also be a, a government uh, ven a vendor for government. Uh, they could also uh, have a number of websites that you don't know who runs it. Uh, they could have different subsidiaries that uh, they share their information within the subsidiary and you don't know that. 
Remember, there was some law, I, mean, yeah. I was finding this law, where uh, investment brokers, you know, had to have, had to separate their business into two different areas. Do you remember what that law is? It escapes me right now. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's where, you know, you I couldn't see. have the investment side of the house uh, sharing information with the, you know, you know, the people that hold your bank accounts. Right. Glass, and, is you talking about Glass-Steagall? Yes. Yes. So in other words, uh, you know, something like that should probably happen with the data brokers, because if you have a LexisNexis, which is a vendor of credit reporting agencies, also their, their supplier of data, <laughs> Yeah. And uh, they're doing things like verifying people's identity for banks. And I did file a consumer complaint against LexisNexis and uh, Bank of the West because they denied me access to my online banking because the, the questions they asked to authenticate me were incorrect. <laughs> they were about my ex-wife from 20 years ago. <laughs> And, and, and there wasn't any way to contest that. And uh, uh, the California Attorney General basically took their side. And then we find out that LexisNexis is now uh, selling information to uh, the Immigration Customs Enforcement, ICE. Yep, <laughs> they are. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a conflict of interest. <laughs> And one of the problems, even with the data broker uh, registries, you'll see uh, different data broker registries uh, entries that are actually owned by the same company. Yeah, you, you see that all the time. I, I have trouble because, you know, I'm trying to, to classify these organizations, these entities, right? And right. Uh, you know, how do, how do I put them in? Like, so for instance, if there's an, 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 enti, uh, an entry for, for Oracle, right? Do I put them in as Oracle or do I put them in as Oracle Data Cloud or do I put them in as any of, you know, a whole bunch of different subsidiaries? And what do I do when they bought up, a, you know, um, five other different, you know, uh, data organizations? Um, you know, do I leave those organizations in as what they were originally named? because they're huge companies, or do I integrate them all and then lose all of that detail? Um, it becomes a, a, a taxonomical nightmare as well as a legal nightmare and you know, uh, an informational nightmare. Yeah, so, so in, in, in the Privacy Act of 1974, basically when you uh, fill out a, a, a privacy request you know, to a, a government agency, they wanna know what's the system that you're actually uh, uh, talking about. And that's also what a lot of companies do. Which products are you talking about? Is it this line? Is it this business line? You know, so Salesforce actually is used uh, to process your data re uh, privacy uh, requests. Mm -hmm. And they're a data broker. <laughs> they're right. selling information as well. AARP, yep. it's a not-for-profit not association but they're definitely a data broker. Yep. But yeah. because they're non nonprofit, they're exempt from the CCPA laws. Hmm. Charities, I've heard charities selling data as well. Yeah. yeah. It was also recently uh, announced that the ACLU is a big uh, supporter of Facebook, Facebook advertising and targeting, which are some of the things that they've come out against, the extensive social targeting of people. So it's, it's pervasive. Yeah. I got a question for you, Jeff. Yes. How many DSARs do you think Axiom got last year after the CCPA went into effect? I heard from the uh, chief global ethics officer, they have one. Um, how many do you think they got? I would guess not very many. I mean, probably a lot in terms of number, but in terms of, you know, percentages of the people that they cover, probably very little. You uh, I would, yeah, yeah, a couple hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah cuz nobody even knows that they're there or how much information they have or or anything. Right. Yeah. So I, I've heard you, you yeah. ask for the data. You got to know who to ask and you got to ask everybody for it. I mean, there are some services like mine where you can go out and have them do send DSARs for you, but 
yeah, I just, there's, there's no easy answer. Even if you make them register, so what? They're going to register and then what? You don't, you can't make them have a fiduciary duty to not be, you know, shady. That's, that's their business, various shades of shady. So you, I don't know that you can fix this. Well, I mean, I think there are some third parties that would like to sort of be a broker, well, not a broker, uh, an agent <laughs> for, for that kind of uh, service where they would, you know, help you opt out and, and from multiple different brokers, right? But from what I've seen, that doesn't work very well yet. Um, you know what does work? A private right of action. Yeah, mm. yeah well, that's for sure. Right? Lawyers. <laughs> right, right. Okay. I was thinking of a new law, and I, I realized I duplicated an acronym. The, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the FDCPA, could be reworked into a, a Fair Data Collection Practices Act, which in a perfect world, we might develop standards and regulations for uh, the circumstances under which data can be collected, shared, sold, uh, how long it's used, what purposes or uh, incremental purposes it could be used. So in theory, there are controls for all of this, but my biggest issue is that the cat is out of the bag and our entire economy, our very existence is so dependent on this sharing of data. And this is what people are excited about. I'm excited that I can go into my car and turn on Spotify and my car knows my, uh, not only the route to work, but also my favorite songs because all these services are sharing this data about me. And they're, they're serving me targeted ads. So I no longer have to listen to, you know, advertisement for women's feminine products or something because it's just not relevant to me. So people are just, you know, globally soaking up this information economy. And I don't, you know, I'm not optimistic about a, a solution after the fact. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, the benefits of, of the information economy are enormous, right? I mean, it, yeah. If we weren't looking at the downsides here, right? The upsides are huge. So that's uh, you know, a big problem with all of this, right? Um, how, do we, how do we get people to focus on the bad stuff when they're getting so many benefits, right? I mean, if, if you just look at one example, look at Facebook, why the hell is anybody still using Facebook? Yeah, because well, you could argue, do not leave it to the government to protect you, leave it to the individual. But then we get the problem like Facebook and, and not only Facebook, let's look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn's privacy practices, you know, I don't think any of us uh, routinely check what the privacy settings are, but they're, you know, they do the same thing. They profile us and our activity off site and everywhere. It's, it's just, it's pervasive, it's our world. Yeah. And there are solutions. The solution is be less digital. That's number one, um, but it's not very practical in today's world. And then the other solution, wherever you go, never, ever use your own identity. Always use someone else's. Then you know you won't be trapped. <laughs> I think that probably some of that's coming. Probably, probably is. Apple, Apple does it. So my um, iPhone, I can use a random um, email address that Apple has created for me. They know who I am, but the end uh, service doesn't know who I am which has its own troubles. Like I used it with uh, a retailer and I don't know what my email address is when I have a problem when I, and I try to reach out to them. It's like, well, you know, that's actually a really good point, right? I mean, I think that, 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 that people create these fake identities so that they can overcome some of these issues, right? And there's, there is definitely a market out there for a product that can do that much more seamlessly than than, than we've been doing it so far, right? Uh, I've always believed that we've had, we have sort of not only the, the need to do that to hide from marketers and advertisers and other things, right? But we have fractured identities, right? We want to show different sides of ourselves to different people. And there's no real easy way to manage those fractured identities and, and different things that we want to display to different, to different people. Um, and there ought to be, right? So that I can log in and show one view to Facebook and one view to the government and one view to these set of friends and another view to these set of friends. But I have to, I mean, and I can do that, I guess, right? If I wanna manage all those different identities, right? But there's no easy way for me to do that without 
screwing it up somehow, right? And having all kinds of different logins that I've got to remember all these different passwords and different versions of myself. Um, and I guess okay. maybe somebody could somebody could juggle that, but I certainly can't do it without screwing it up. Uh, you can use a good password manager. <laughs> Right. Identity it might help, could... but we shouldn't have to do all this. We should be able to trust the entities that we give our data. And right. it, that should be it. Like, I, I want you, you, you to have my data. You guys can talk to each other, but I don't want you to sell my data. Right. But it's mm, hard, isn't it? I don't think it's realistic. I think that... Yeah. We've all seen it as a wake-up call into the reality of human nature, and, you know, of our economies. No matter where you are, it's built upon this transfer collection of data. Yeah. Well, let's look a little bit further here, guys. Um, so, so who are the who are the big players in and data brokers? Um, before we get into the the, the larger picture, even. So uh, first a question though, when we talk about big players in the data worker space, what does that mean? Is it we talk about revenues? We talk about the depth of the data they hold, maybe the invasiveness of the data. There are a lot of different ways to think about it. Um, there's actually a market study that's out that you can pay $30,000 for um, that looks at some of the top players. Um, there are a lot of lists if you search for top data brokers, you know, Google will tell you who some of them are. Um, there's a lot of articles that'll list three to 10 of the top data brokers. I'm not sure what they're, you know, I'm not sure where they get that, that list from. I think they just sort of make it up, but you know, um, there you go. And then there are of course the top credit bureaus. There used to be three, now there's really four. I think uh, Innovis has really joined Equifax, Experian and TransUnion um, as, uh, as another one, right? They provide businesses with credit related services like authentication and fraud solution, portfolio management. So there's all of those, right? And here's sort of my view of what that, what that looks like. So this is a lot of data. Hopefully you can, you can view this screen, but, um, uh, these aren't in any particular order, but if you look at this middle row in the middle, that is actually the 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 list from the uh, the market study, right? And they've got Axiom, CoreLogic, Oracle, PQ, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, and this gives you a little bit of a peek at uh, some of the data pieces that that I've gathered on all the data brokers in my data set. Um, you know, I, I sort of have different, uh, you know, whether they're public or private, uh, some classifications that we'll talk about a little bit more, what kind of industries they focus on, you know, the different sectors, whether it's real estate or analytics or financial or consulting or publishing, um, what industry uh, subdivision they're in, you know, internet or media or something else. And even, you know, their, their employee ranges and revenue ranges. And you can see here, in this particular set that most of these are incredibly large companies with billions of dollars in revenue. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So I think you could probably take this list and say that you probably covered most of the large data brokers, but you'll notice, right, that there are no Facebooks and Google in this list because this is more of a traditional list of data brokers, right? Not a list that would include some of the people that I think we should be thinking of today as data brokers. So how do you define a data broker then? Well, that's coming. That's a very good question, right? Because that's it's a, it's a incredibly tough question. What is a data broker? And we're gonna to get to that in just a moment, right? Oh, sorry. I actually clicked in. This is actually the live view of that data, but we don't actually need to do that. So I'm going to go back to that. Jeff, a lot of these entries are United States centric. Is that representative of the industry or are you not addressing uh, well, European, Asian? Yes and no. So uh, it is a lot US centric, but I have not addressed the international market as much as needs to be addressed. So I would say both yes and no to that answer. Okay. Oh, is it because of capitalism? Yeah. 
Um, I, I am focused more on on uh, the U.S. market. That's where my original data sources were, and I'm going to I'm going to get to that in a second. But um, but I have neglected the international market, uh, and I need to address that. It's actually one of the things that, that I need to get to. So let's look real quick at a, a couple of uh, regulations that affect brokers. We talked a little bit about FACRA, right? GDPR does also affect uh, um, brokers. Um, let me just actually back up and say this. So, so all these huge companies with massive amounts of data, surely they're regulations, right? Really, FACRA is the only thing that is squarely aimed at brokers. Um, and they, but there's a problem there because they really only affect things that define are defined as consumer reports. And a consumer report has a lot of limitations, right? It, it's something that, that uh, is a communication of any information that bears on a consumer's credit worthiness, credit standing, credit capacity, character, reputation, things like that, right? But only if it's uh, for the use of giving people credit or employment or a few other permissible purposes. So if you take that same information and say you're going to use it for marketing purposes or dating purposes or any kind of personal reasons, even stalking, as long as you don't call it stalking, completely okay, All right? So only a portion of brokers are complying. Um, I'm actually getting ahead of myself. So, so essentially, all the people that are collecting, collecting profiles on you, right? Uh, only a few of them are covered by FACRA, right? And then if you look at some of this other stuff like the GDPR, right? It, it affects things that are um, automated, pro oh, sorry. It affects automated processing, right? So that sort of affects maybe brokers in some ways. CCPA affects um, you know, your right to opt out so that if you can find those brokers, you could potentially opt out, but we've talked already about how that's really not very effective and very few people are actually doing it, right? Then you've got a couple of state laws in Virginia, sorry, for in Vermont, I guess I got the wrong initials there, it should be Vermont, not VA, in California that uh, require data brokers to register, but they're frankly not all that effective, right? Um, there are people that are registering, but there's really no enforcement and yeah, it is what it is. There are also a couple of other things. There's uh, the Digital Services Act that you know, is proposed in the European Union that would regulate very large uh, online providers. And there's also a new uh, proposed bill in Nevada that would uh, prohibit data brokers from making any sale of information, certain information collected about consumers in the state if, uh, if they want to opt out, essentially another opt out bill. So those are the, the, the things that actually affect brokers right now. Um, there's also been a heck of a lot of failed attempts in state legislation. And there was also some, uh, some other failed uh, um, attempts in federal legislation. I only point to this because I want to make another quick point. The markup just came out with uh, a report. I think it was just a couple of weeks ago that there's a pretty large um, lobbying effort on behalf of data brokers. Um, 25 of those companies spent about $29 million uh, last year lobbying um, senators and congressmen on their behalf. Um, probably in attempts to get most of these bills quashed. So um, you can see that they've actually got, uh, you know, they have probably some reason to not be regulated, right? That they're not regulated now and they don't wanna be regulated. We do have a question from the audience. Yeah, what's up? Re regarding the definition of the data brokers. Um, well, we're, actually, we're actually going right into that now, so that's awesome. That's Okay, great. Um, so what's the question? So Craig says, I see Bloomberg on the list, but they are mostly a business, just like Crunchbase, who is also registered on this uh, California registry. Is it only for consumer data or people in business when you're defining a data broker? Okay. 
and correct I, me if I did not voice that uh, question correctly. <laughs> I didn't quite get that. Um, you, you're oh, muted, you're on right? mute. <laughs> So is a data broker someone that sells consumer information, business information, or information about people in business? Is there any yeah. distinction about that? Well, I don't think there's any there's any distinction there. I've actually ran across that, right? And so um, I would say that somebody that sells business DA is probably less of a data broker, but you know it's a it's a fine line, right? Because if you're selling business DA, it, it, you're selling okay, who's the the top sales guy or the CEO for this company? That's uh, already private uh, personal information now, right? So business DA becomes personal information very quickly. So I don't think you can really make that distinction. Uh, that, that's my my opinion, right? Um, yeah, but um, you know, and the larger question of defining a data broker is pretty tough, right? How do you define it? It should be easy, but it's not. If you look at Wikipedia, the simple definition is collecting information about individuals from public records and private sources. But once you get a lawyer or a politician involved, complications arise quickly, <laughs> right? Um, the California law and the Vermont law are pretty close to each other. Uh, they essentially talk about aggregating and selling data. Um, and um, mm. but the problem is the problem is is that that it goes a little bit more complicated, right? Uh, this was more of an informational slide here. The, the next slide actually tells us really what we what we need to get into, right? So if you look at the the definition in the California law, um, this was broken out in a lawfare blog post actually just this month, right? And what it says essentially is there's five different pieces uh, that you have to meet to be uh, a broker under the California law. And um, this is CCPA, right? So to be considered uh, uh, a broker, you have to be considered a business under C CCPA. So that's a bit of a loophole, right? You have to actually collect the data, which is a loophole. You have to sell the data, which is a loophole. It has to be considered PII, which is a loophole. And the biggest one, you have to have, you have to not have a direct relationship with the consumer, which is another loophole, right? So that's why Facebook and Google and uh, all the social media platforms, for instance, aren't considered data brokers by those laws because they have a direct relationship with the consumer. But I, I object to that. Not, not to you, but the, Facebook gets so much data mm -hmm. about me, even when I'm not their customer. So they don't have direct relationship with me, but they right. still collect so much data. How are they not a data broker? Yeah, well, that's a good point, right? So maybe for you, they are a data broker, but if I'm a member or user, then they're not for me. That, that's actually a great point. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, but you know, I, I, you know, I think that it just gets way too complicated here with with all these things, right? And, and as I said before, there's no real fines or enforcement for for these laws, right? Uh, I also think that, you know, for some of the smaller companies, there is maybe an issue of, do these companies even know that they're a broker, right? Um, as I've been thinking through this, I, I even sort of wonder, you know, should we, be, should we be trying to make different laws for data brokers as opposed to other types of companies? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe we just need a law for, you know, data privacy in general, as opposed it's to trying to, to break it out for, for you know, for data brokers, because the definition is so complicated here, um, I I don't know if we can we can right. I don't think you even need new laws or specific ones. The current ones already cover this for the personal information, but it's just cannot enforce because you don't even know if they're there. Right, right. But you know, I think defining what a data broker is uh, or classifying it may be somewhat helpful. I don't know. Um, 
if you look back at the F that FTC report that we talked about earlier, right, they had three recommendations and those three recommendations were based upon three different types of workers that they defined. And those were, were marketing, risk mitigation and people search, right? Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good classification system, but I think it needs some evolution, right? One problem is it doesn't address those companies like Facebook and Google that collect massive amounts of data, but don't directly sell it. They, they monetize it in different ways, right? So I developed a classification system that I use for, for all the data that I've collected, right? And I've been looking and at- And people are hearing it first here, right? Before. Yeah. I've mentioned it a couple of places, but I've never really- oh, no. So this is actually the first, the first <laughs> time that you, people are actually seeing it in, in detail. So this is the first. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, so here are the, the four types, right? So there's a searcher, right? And a searcher allows you to find out information about a person by using their name, phone, email, and, or other types of PII, right? Uh, and examples of those might be Facebook or Thrive or Spokio or White Pages, PQ, right? Um, a screener collects information, collects any and all information, a data that might be used to generate a risk profile. And, and sells uh, those profiles uh, of you to companies who make decisions on law, jobs, loans, leases, insurance, more, right? Uh, it also sort of includes uh, identity verification, uh, but I sort of lump that together, right? A targeter collects large amounts of data used for targeting and they might, they're not necessarily generating a profile, but they might just be collecting a single piece of prime information like location, uh, or they might be aggregating lots of it, uh, information into a targeting profile for an advertiser. And then a monetizer is essentially a new category, right? That tar uh, uh, it's, a, it's like a target, but it doesn't sell data, rather it generates revenue from the data it collects from its user base. And this often means that it's uh, uh, allowing others uh, to target that user base with advertising. Companies can actually fall into more than one category. If you can see here, I've actually got Facebook in all four of these categories, right? They're a searcher, they're a screener, they're a targeter, and they're a monetizer, right? And you can also see highlighted in green here, I've got Equifax as both a screener and a targeter. So if this was like in, in print media, where it's not electronic, the targeter would be the ads that I'm seeing on the pages of the magazine. Right, right. So it's really sort of like how you use the data. Um, right? I find this as a useful ontology, but I should point out that it can be troublesome to decide where some companies fit. It's not always easy to automatically ascribe each of these tags to an entity. It can be simple at times if you know that a company is like an ad tech company, right? For instance, to simply market them as a targeter, but not all entities are easy to label. Um, and I imagine maybe some companies might argue that the designations I've given them should be different. Um, there's also the question that I haven't addressed about monetizers and that's the size of a monetizer. It's, it's pretty easy to see that Google and Facebook fit in as a monetizer in that category, right? All social media companies really fit in there, right? In fact, I think the Digital Services Act is on the right path with the, their conception of the, the large, uh, very large online platform designation, right? But where do you draw the line there, right? Is every company and small app that advertises to their customers um, a monetizer? Probably not, right? I mean, then you'd be, you'd be essentially saying that virtually every company's a monetizer and every company's a, a data broker and that doesn't really work right so you probably have some line that you've got to draw in size uh, uh for that data broker for that monetization bucket so the, the the charity which sells information for money would be a monetizer yeah they would are there any comments from the audience on the classifications I take that as a no. All right, let's move all on. Right. Cool. Well, based upon all this, I've actually put together um, uh, my data set in, in Tableau. I'll hop into Tableau here just quickly, show you this because it's easier to show you this in Tableau than
Uh, why is that taking so long? You're so also about, presenting that sometimes impacts the speed. Yeah. So I'm going to make this a little bit larger in a second. But if you look at some visualization, visualizations, I've got about over 1,200 organizations in my data set, uh, about 300 more that I'm ready to onboard, and a backlog of a bunch of different resources that I need to add, uh, search and add. Now, not all the data is completely tagged, as all this is really done by hand. Um, but I've created this data set by scraping the California Data Broker Registry and the Vermont Data Broker Registry, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse data set, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau data. They've got a small set of credit reporting agencies and specialty CRAs, as well as obviously a lot of my own research. And after aggregating all those entities from different sources, I went to the data broker Clearbit, who handles business directory information like Craig was referring to and appended information about all those companies. And then I also did additional scrapes of my own on each company's website to grab their privacy policy and other privacy links like opt out and do not sell and some other enhancements as well. And then I've taken all this information and put it into Tableau so that you can actually see it here. I'm gonna go full screen so you get a little bit more real estate. Um, but essentially, you can see some some different views here. A lot of them are software and services um, over well, close to a thousand of them. Uh, the majority of them are sort of communication and business services, though there are some other things here. The largest percentage of the, the businesses have between 50 and 250 employees. Um, and an even larger percentage of them have sort of 11 to 50. So it's not all just those huge corporations we're talking about. There are a lot of smaller organizations in here, right? The largest number in these buckets are, are smaller, right? And even if you look at the revenue ranges, the, the largest number, right, are uh, 1 million to 10 million in revenue and 10 million to 50 million in revenue. Right, in terms of the sheer number of people that I have in this data broker database. Um, and then if we can scroll down a little bit further here, this sort of shows you a view here that, that the majority of the, the, the entities I have in here right now are advertising and marketing, and they're focused on targeting, right? But there are 167 people search, right? Um, and, and some other sort of statistics here, right? This also has uh, data here on, on uh, HR, uh, sorry, not HR. Um, the, the, the large circles here show the revenue that these companies are generating. So even though the bar is smaller, the circle is larger. So there's only 75 companies here that are in the HR space, right? essentially doing data broker for, for uh, probably background checks and, and other types of screening, but they're making a heck of a lot of money in that space, right? And similarly in the financial space, right? Uh, there's 111 of those, but they're making a lot of money. Social media space, making a lot of money. The ad targeting and stuff, 415 companies, but making less money overall than these other market sectors, if that makes sense, All right? So some pretty interesting statistics. You also see down here, retail and medical, very few companies, lots of money. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, um, this, this, this data point here is primarily because of a data broker called Optum, right? That sells medical and prescription data. Oh. They're a data broker that you should know about and nobody knows about. Are they US? Yep. Okay, I'm going to pop back oh, here. Man. We'll take uh, some. Uh, Let's some take a second to take it all in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can go back and look at some more stuff. Um, Sorry, so the quick one that thing at the bottom was that, was that billions? What was the number at the bottom? Which one? The, the last one, the one you had at the bottom. If you go oh, scroll down. Sorry, let me go back. Yeah, yeah. So the when you said they, they big, what's what's the 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 axis at the top? Like zero, fifty, a hundred, what's that number? Mm. This here? Yeah. 
This is the number of entities. Ah, uh, okay. Huh. That do that. Okay. Yeah. Come number from. of ent entities in my data set. Who are selling those kind of data, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great Any chart. idea of the vol yeah. the volume of the the market space? Um. Not really. This is. Um, what do you mean by volume? Like how much data they're selling? Well, how much they're selling for, right? You know. No, I don't have that data. Yeah. That's, so what, that what, what is confidential information. But one of the arguments with all this is the fact that, you know, the, this money should be flowing to the owners of that data, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They, they're selling your data, right? And, and yeah. there, will be, there will be a much more fairer model if actually you get a cut out yep. of, you know, of, of what gets used. It's almost like you're an artist, right? But uh, you don't get any royalty of what comes out of you, right? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree, Dennis. Um, let me flip back over here. I'm gonna show you some other views that'll that maybe give you even some more insights. So if we go from here to the next slide, right? This gives you a view based upon the sectors that these um, companies are focused on, right? So, as I said, the advertising and marketing was sort of the largest one, but I've tagged all these companies with the different tags that they're in, right? And some companies are focused on multiple things, right? So that might be both in financial and advertising and marketing and medical, right? But if you look at the, the different, uh, you know, places where all these things build up, right? It, it's actually pretty interesting. So there's actually 415 companies in the ads, uh, ad advertising and marketing space, uh, 120 in consumer search, 111 in financial. And these are just the companies that I have in my data set, right? There are, there are more companies, right? Um, but I've got 88 in social media, 87 in analytics, 75 in HR, 61 in uh, tech stack, uh, 60 in ad tech, which you could probably add to the, the, the 400 15 in, in advertising and marketing, uh, 41 in mapping, 47 in real estate, 37 in CRM, 32 in publishing, 26 in navigation. Uh, yeah, and the list goes on, right? Uh, we can actually see that live if we wanted to do that too, um, but it doesn't really give you addition, much additional information. But there are, you can see the sort of smaller one. I've got a couple of fundraising companies and a lead generation company and there's law enforcement and identity management and maps and right. Um, I'll actually show you the, the the live data. In fact, let me go back to that real quick and just show you some of the the actual data here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Let me go back to here. <clears throat> show you the actual data that, that, that the Tableau stuff is based upon. So you get sort of an idea of that. It won't be the easiest thing to understand. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. Um, it's probably a little bit too hard to, to view, but I wanna sort of give you a sort of a, an idea of the scope of the data, right? So I've got all of these companies in here, right? Just sort of giving you an idea, right? Of how much is there. And in addition to the names and legal names and the DBAs and statuses and, you know, different data pieces that you can see here, I've got, you know, all kinds of descriptive information, what companies that they connect to. Um, I'm starting to get some stuff about the data records that they have, Dennis. So like, you know, uh, 2,500, this is like millions, right? And what kinds of records that they hold and what kinds of categories of records that they hold. And then the classification scheme that we started to look at, right? As well as all of these sort of focuses, right? Isn't this the kind of stuff that eventually, you know, a government agency should almost just provide? Yeah, right. right? You know, because they, they sh you should be mandatory to register, right? So you, you shouldn't have to go and hunt this data. You should be given this data because none of, none of, nobody should be doing <laughs> this without being, you know, acknowledged, right? Well, somebody ought to be doing it. It's a too big of a job for one guy to be doing it. That's for damn sure. Right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But so I've got all this information. There's a few other things that we'll talk about too. Right. But yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a whole lot of 
a lot of data on these companies that I'm collecting, right? And some of it is hand generated. So anyway, I just wanted to sort of show you what the data looked like. So, so at, at what point do you also become a data broker? <laughs> to some extent, yeah, right? <laughs> I'm a data broker. When are you going to Congress to offer your testimony on this? Side? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's another set here of uh, the landscape, right? Uh, of uh, the different types of data, right? You're probably getting tired of seeing data, so I'll sort of like skim through this stuff here and get to something else that's sort of interesting, right? So, in addition to taking all of that data, right, uh, I, I cross referenced all of that information for data brokers against breaches. Right. So if you look at all the, the, the breaches that data brokers had, there's 74 breaches from 58 different data brokers and 10 entities had two or more breaches. And I'm going to publish this full data set on privacy plan. But if you want to look at it here real quick, right, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, TransUnion, uh, Innovis, uh, Adobe, LinkedIn, Dun & Bradstreet and Thomson Reuters have all had multiple data breaches. And I track those data breaches, uh, not just you know that they had a breach, but the year, the type, the amount, the detail. Um, and but these data breaches are data breaches of data that they hold, right? So, yeah, so yeah. What, if they were Microsoft, it's not Microsoft had a data breach like SolarWinds. Is when when something that you know they they were holding data that got exposed, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 Or it could be the license information that people buy. They probably keep that information somewhere. Yep. When you buy like Microsoft use licenses, mm -hmm. they, that could be that as well. So we've got that. And then I also cross-referenced it with consent orders. So I found that there were 33 uh, consent orders from the FTC, as well as uh, one ICO action that I found. I have actually haven't done much with the, the European actions, so I need to, to add that to the data set. But those violations range from criminal to, to less severe, right? So for for non-US weavers, what is oh, the consent order? <laughs> sure, so that's actually a good point, right? So the FTC um, monitors sort of privacy and other violations. And um, essentially those are sort of enforced with what we call consent orders. Um, it's sort of dumb, it may sound dumb to, to non, non US people, but essentially what it is is um, the company will agree to stop doing what they're doing and rectify the situation and often pay a fine. And that's sort of like a, like a court order, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of a slap on the wrist approach, but right. Um, they also generally get 10 years worth of monitoring and oversight mm -hmm. along with that. And the bigger stick is that if they do it again, then they're really, really in trouble, right? And that's actually how Facebook ended up with this $5 billion fine that the FTC just hit them with um, last year because they, they had a consent order against them in 2012 and they violated that consent order. So, and a couple of companies have done that, like LifeLock did that and somebody else, right? So you may get a consent order and it may just seem like a slap on the wrist, but if you get another one because you violated the first one, watch out, right? That's when you're in real trouble. So um, consent order is sort of like a court judgment, but a little bit different. Thank you. So there's a few different types of you know things here, um, false security promises, accuracy and tenant screening, different things like that. But these are things that apply to those different data brokers. And I've got a sort of a chart of those as well. We won't necessarily go into those, um, but uh, you can see some of the stuff that's going on here, right? And so I'm gonna probably put out a, a chart of that stuff as well. So we've got data breaches, We've got uh, consent orders, right? And then uh, we've also got law enforcement connections, right? So I've tracked all of the, the different law enforcement connections that I've been able to track. This is essentially based upon media reports. We need a better way to figure this out. There's gotta be some algorithmic way we can figure out what data brokers are working with, um, with law enforcement. 
And I think there's probably some way to do that, but I haven't quite figured that out yet. So um, you could probably see a few of those there. Right? But if you take those three different things, there's actually a fourth thing as well. Um, uh, privacy lawsuits, like major privacy lawsuits that have happened currently or in the past. I track all of those four different things, the data breaches, the consent orders, the law enforcement connections, and, and privacy lawsuits. And I put all those different data points together and generated what I call a data stewardship index. Essentially, how effectively or ineffectively are these data brokers taking care of our data, right? And so I'm getting ready to publish this and you guys are going to see it here first, right? Is who's been bad, who's been bad with our data, <laughs> right? Um, and here's what I came up with. So if you look over here on the right, this is the, the data stewardship index. Um, and the number one bad boy is Facebook by a long shot. And that's so, because they, so they it's have reverse of so the bigger the uh, number um yeah the higher number is worse okay um, and this is based upon them having um a lot of several several breaches and a couple of consent orders and the lawsuits and stuff um and the numbers just add up right yeah we so, take your privacy seriously right you know, and, and I need to, to point out, right, you know, um, I'll, I'll post the full data set and, and stuff soon on, on privacy plans so people can sort of see that along with a write, with a write up. Uh, I may adjust the calculations. You guys can give me some feedback if, if you think that I need to, to do that. Um, but, you know, bigger companies are also bigger targets, right? Much more opportunity to, to, to screw up, but also more resources to do better with, right? Um, but if you've got that much data, you know, it's a whole lot easier to have more screw ups. So I just wanted to put that out there, right? Doesn't, doesn't this have GDPR implications? I don't know. Because, because a, a, one of the things that GDPR talks about is again, your right to privacy, your right of the data being protected. You know, I, I remember being involved in conversations where we were talking about, look, if this is enforced, you know, the way they could be, you know, when you have breaches like this, you should be in trouble, right? So you how many of so? these, how many of these have been, you know, affect EU citizens and have had any GDPR, you know, reporting to the ICOs and, and I've, I've been had fines or something done to them? Well, I think all these individual incidents have probably been looked at by the regulators, right? So I'm not I'm not reporting any new incidents here. I'm just adding up all the incidents and saying, hey, these guys have been not so good with your data. Right? Yeah, but my point is that if if nothing has happened to them, then you could see why they probably wouldn't care, right? Yeah, well, yeah, but absolutely. If, if, if for these incidents, they had 50% <laughs> of their turnover as a fine, I guarantee you they would pay attention, right? Yeah, yeah, it might be in the works. Sometimes the regulator takes some time to make their assessment and what what the fine will be. And yeah, right. maybe right. maybe we'll see more. I hope we will see more. It's well, yeah, yeah it's you know, fair. and I'd like I'd like to continue to refine this. You know, I don't know that this this stewardship index is is perfect yet in terms of the calculation, but I think that the the conception has a lot of value because we have a problem with all these companies, you know, um, not handling our data in, in great ways. And we need some way to be more accountable, right? And I think this is a way to start to do that because people forget about the, the breach that happened a year ago, let alone, you know, eight years ago. And these things should be adding up and they should be they should be tallied in some way, right? And having a score that somebody can look at and say, hey, this is a problem, right? I think this is one way to do that. Yeah, I still feel that pollution is a great analogy for this kind of stuff, right? Because we, we had this problem in pollution, right? Where, you know, companies were polluting. And like you said, you know, they were polluting left, right, and center. But it was only when you start to get the magnitude, right, of what they were doing that, uh, you know, basically regulations and, and even society change, right? Yeah, absolutely.
Interesting analogy. Yeah, you know, I've actually heard that one before, and I like I like that analogy a lot, Dennis. It's a guy from is David Prince Prince Prince. Oh, okay. He's the guy that uh, he did a great presentation at OAS conference, um, and he he made that analogy. It was one of the best ones I've seen. Yeah. I think he's well, also David part Rice. of our community. So, so Dave Rice. Uh, yeah, but not only he went and worked for Apple, and we haven't heard anything since from him. Well, I've been going on too long here, guys. Let me wrap this up with these last two slides, right? Um, originally, I thought that we needed spe uh, uh, regulation specific to, to brokers. Um, but as I've learned more, studied uh, privacy legislation, I'm sort of thinking that that kind of uh, solution is problematic, right? I, I think I'd rather see comprehensive privacy legislation that enshrines data privacy rights. But I'd encourage you to look at solutions like Oasis Labs and Big Token and Infosum, see what kind of technology might, uh, what technology might bring to that game. Because if we can control our own data, our own identity, I think we can begin to control the data brokers. Um, don't forget about that lesson earlier. We've got to have a system where we stop making copies of personal data and sharing them over and over and over again, or having them sold over and over and over again. Right. One final thing, um, you saw the data, right? I need to add more entities. There's lots of areas for growth, especially in international brokers. I wanna get that up to like 5K by the end of the year. I need to automate you know, how it looks for breaches and some other things. And get some international fines in there, as well as interact. You know, makes the 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 U, uh, the interactive UX on, on Tableau even better than it is now. So uh, I'm actually seeking partnerships and grants. Sorry. Um, so if anybody's got any ideas or is interested, let me know. Send people my way. How are you publishing all this? Do you have GitHub repos and stuff like that? Uh, right now, I'm just uh, doing it on my own, and I've got. Uh, yeah, uh, most of the stuff on my website. So no, I haven't done it on repo yet uh, or, or GitHub or anything, but I need to start doing that. Yeah, GitHub is a great place to capture this, right? And also to, to start, you know, getting that community and, 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 and tracking some of these things. And then have you, have you looked at some uh, like Jupyter Notebooks? I haven't. Yeah, uh, like they use a lot for data science and, and some of the things you're doing as you get into a bit more coding or, you know, like some of the analysis, you might find that they're quite good. But Tableau is really powerful, right? I think for a lot of the stuff you do is, is already really cool. Yeah, I, I know it because I know the visualizations, but frankly, I'm not tied to it. Uh, it's pretty expensive too. Yeah. yeah. How can we, 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 we reach Oops, Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, go on. No, that's a good question. I was going to ask uh, Jeff, how would you like people to reach? So I have a, um, posted our Slack invite. So you are on our Slack. So people who are already in our Slack can reach you over there. Oh. But uh, for people, the viewers who are not in our Slack. I've got my, uh, I got my name wrong. My, my phone number is wrong in here. That's the wrong phone number. That's not me. <laughs> that's great. I think that's a great that, way to poison your data. That's wrong. Uh, that, that's not my phone number, guys. Sorry. Not even close to my phone number. <laughs> it's another Jeff. <laughs> so it's the, it is the right email address, though. Okay. Uh, and are you on Twitter? Uh, I am on Twitter. I, I am uh, um, private uh, privacy underscore Stan at uh, Twitter. Yeah, it was on the first slide, I think. Yeah, should have put that on there. Cool. Cool. So I think we should you know, we need to think about what, what other sessions we can do, right? Because I think this, there's a lot of topics here, right? I think it's even expanding on, I think some of these is, is worth sometimes going on a, a smaller subset, right? Now that you got almost this good presentation, if you have ideas or, you know, we, we think about what other topics we can do, it's, uh, it's worth thinking. And we do this every month, right? So, you know, next month or the week after, month after, right? So yes. I think there's lots of great stuff here. And, and thanks for doing your, your presentation you know with, with us here right you know it's very a privilege i appreciate it too guys this was uh good uh, i appreciate all the interaction yeah and it is interesting because 
although we're doing it virtually, right? You know, even at even at the real summit, right? You know, like the real summit, like the on-site summit, right? You know, sometimes the best sessions are sessions with like five, six, seven, ten people, but you just happen to have those people that are really, really interested in that topic, right? And and you get some great conversations, which is the whole point of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. All right, thanks. Any for final comments, questions, final comments? anything from Tom? I think you might. No, that was great. A lot of information to digest. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming, Tom and and Craig and, and and everyone. Thank you, everybody. It was good. Okay, thanks.